So I've been asked to come along, they've dragged the sewers and got me, and, and I'm going to tell you about some of these exotic diseases that I see. Right? And the reason I've come in like this, I'm fourth generation veterinarian. My grandfather was at London, my great grandfather was at Edinburgh, uh, and that's my kilt is because I went to the tropical centre in Edinburgh in 1978 for my masters. Then they sent me, British government, you know, they, 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 were, they trained me up in Portuguese and then they sent me to North Yemen. <laughs> Ring any bells, you know? So that's what I did. And, and I brought my umbrella because you, ladies and gentlemen, are the umbrella for Australia for all these notifiable diseases. If the shit falls on us, it's going to get most of you guys first. And what I hope you've learnt today is what to do with it, where to deflect it. <laughs> so let me just share with you the very first time I was in Australia and got a, a notifiable. A lady rang me on a Saturday afternoon and she said, I've got this bags, plastic bags from China, and there's a moth in it, and I don't recognise it. And I said, oh, I, said, oh, I don't know, I'm not a math expert. I said, but I've never rung like, it, that exotic disease hotline, that 1-800 number, right? So I said, L I'll do it. So I rang them up, and they were very good. He, he, he said, I'll find, and they rang me back within about a quarter of an hour, and I told the lady, I said, wrap it in another plastic bag, put it in the deep freeze, and we'll work out what has to go. See? Anyway, guess what the, the, the guy that rang me back from the specialist said? Put it in a plastic bag and put it in the deep freeze. <laughs> hey? So I said, I'm ahead of you. So he said, oh, that's good. Anyway, it turned out it was an Australian moth that had been packaged in Sydney. <laughs> right? And they just, so... But I now knew how the system worked. So then one Sunday night when I was up in Glen Innes, I got a call from a gentleman who said he's got some very rare, and he did give me the name, insect that was on his, um, uh, you know, the, 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 what's, that, what's that cotton stuff that grows? And there was this big mound of cotton in there, and he named the thing, you see? And I thought, oh, I have no idea. So I looked it up, and it's sort of like the foot and mouth disease of the cotton world. See? So I said, oh, sh I'd better go. So I rang the hotline, but it was that other lot, the plant lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, t I thought, I'll test that part of the system. And it took them two and a half hours to get back to me. Please report that, because... They're long since gone now. But they, they rang me back. Well, it was getting dark, so I was there waiting, and I didn't get the call till after dark. Anyway, I collected samples, and it wasn't that. But it's like me missing foot and mouth disease if I'd missed that bugger, you see? So I thought I'd better do it. So my first experience with exotic diseases, really, was in the UK, because as a little boy growing up, we had foot and mouth disease, 69, eh? So it comes... We, I, my dad was worked for the government and he was in charge of 2,000 dairy cows just south of the Thames and it came down the, uh, the, the slopes and it got as far as the Thames and we were the other side of the Thames and I thought if it comes this side my dad will help kill all the 2,000 head and he'll save the last bullet for himself because he you know he was that sort of person anyway it didn't get there mercifully but it was really interesting because what happened then um, was that we had enough vets in practice to come in and help do the job. I mean, such as I knew as a 19-year-old know, boy. But, but uh, when it came to the 2001, I was working in Bombala. And so I said, look, guys, I'm going to take time off work to go over and help. They didn't have enough. Do you know why? It was all down to those small animal vets. Are you a small animal vet? No. <laughs> How many of you are in practice? Right. So... If acting, 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 <laughs> CBO, <laughs> pressed the button and said we want a livestock standstill, and it's starting tonight, how many of you would be able to work over the weekend on the result? Yesterday I asked the question, or the day before, uh, two people answered, and I got one on either side. Today is, yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Because if you've... Got, that's all right. It's, it's Judy, no, it's great. 
Because you see, I'm here to tell you that when I started at your age, uh, well, younger than most of you, I, I wanted to go into small, into large animal practice. So I went into small animal practice first to master the skills. And then I went, so we were in a mixed practice and, and I made a hell of a lot of mistakes. Well, I, I did. And, and nobody said no, sorry, aren't you on my side? <laughs> You're supposed to say no, you didn't. Anyway, so I, but my bosses and the ministers and, and the ministry stuff, they never once told me off for having a go, right? And we, used, we were what were called lo LVIs, local veterinary inspectors. So we did a lot of the anthrax, brucellosis stuff, and you made those decisions on the run. And we carried microscopes to, to test the samples on the farms for anthrax, etc. And But they never once did it uh, and told me off because I'd sent in ridiculous samples. And I think the same would go here, would it not? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you send samples in, you're going to get support. So... Let me tell you a story. When I was in Glen Innes two years ago, I suppose, Sunday morning, young vet rang me up and said, no, he said, we've got some barrowing problems, stillbirths and what have you in, in some pigs up near Tenterfield. He said, what, I've, got, I've just dropped in two piglets. I've never done a post-mortem in a piglet. So unlike you people, never done a post-mortem. And uh, so I said, well, look, you've got two things to do. She said, what samples do I send? So I said, well, open them up and here's what you need to send. I'd actually open one up, take all due care, and open it up yourself because you might not get another chance for a while, and send the other one intact. Therefore, if you balls it up, they can, <laughs> they can correct your mistake. So anyway, she said, well, what do I ask for? So I went through a, a list of things, and then I said, oh, you better put this Japanese encephalitis on the, on the list. And she said, why am I doing that? We don't have that in Australia. I said, that way... That the, the government will pay a lot of the testing fees, right? <laughs> so she said, oh, all right. Well, we came back as number three or four or something in the, in the state or country or whatever. And that's Tenterfield right on the border. So those are the sorts of things that you need to, to be thinking about. There's that BSE, that mad cow stuff. You see, if the government doesn't have tests, they can't actually put their hand on their heart and say, we've looked for it. You see, that puts them in line with the Mongols. Just, just a moment, just a moment. <laughs> Take that one off. I put on my Mongolian hat. So the Mongols have a very good way of deciding and telling OIE that they are free of diseases. They don't test for them, right? <laughs> So I look at hold of some historical records up to look and see what they'd had. I mean, by historical, not from the time of Genghis Khan, but the last year. And, and they had several notifiable diseases, including foot and mouth, and they didn't do any testing this year. None at all. So they were clear. <laughs> Simple as that. Simple as that. Trumpism. Now, sorry? Trumpism. Oh, that's Trumpism. <laughs> Of the first order, I'm sure they taught him all he knew. And, and so it's, they had foot and mouth years ago in Mongolia, and they declared it. Do you know where it was? It was in the veterinary faculty, in their field station, right? And they still never found out. Do you know how they solved the, solved the problem of getting foot and mouth in the veterinary field station? They shut it down. So all the time I was there, and that was up until 10 years, up, yeah, t nine years ago, they, they didn't have a veterinary field station with animals on it. That way they couldn't get foot and mouth. It's, it's clever, isn't it? Yeah, it's clever. So I first saw foot and mouth, as I say. I didn't actually see it as a little boy. But then I went to North Yemen. Hang on a minute. So in North Yemen, they wear headgear that's a bit like this. Right? And they wrap it around their head and do this sort of thing. So I went there in 79. And... Foot and mouth was rampant. Came every spring because um, it was hiding away in the mountains and the valleys and what have you. So there am I on the Tahama. Now the Tahama is that strip that goes down beside the Red Sea. It's about 80 miles wide and then goes up on the edge of the Rift Valley. So there am I looking at this foot and mouth. That's really serious there. 
Not that it kills them any more than it does elsewhere. There's a few calves die, etc. Um, they do have a few gazelles, because we all know that gazelles are really prone to getting it, don't we? Yes, <laughs> good. somebody was listening. And, um, and, and so they did get that. But it's a real problem in springtime, because what happens in these regions? It's the flat area. And what do they do in springtime? They plant seeds. And they have a plough, a wooden plough that's pulled by a couple of beasts, right? So they pull it along and the man goes behind with this plough, see, and he's got a little tube and he's got his seeds in a basket. And as they go along, he drops them down this tube into the bottom of the, the ploughshare and they go into the soil. But if your animals are lame and can't walk, how do you manage? One simple answer, gentlemen. You get your wife and your daughter pulling the plough. And I've got lots of pictures of ladies pulling the plough. And interesting, although they're Arabs, they've got a lot of, of uh, dark skin influence from Africa in them. So quite a few of these ladies are naked from the waist up. Right? You wouldn't think that in a Muslim country, would you? But they do. So that was the problem. So then one day, I got to recognise, got a bit blasé about foot and mouth, you know. One day I go to this village because they said they've got 28 out of 32 cows are dead. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking this isn't foot and mouth. They don't die like that. Anybody any idea what it could have been? And I'm talking 1970, 1980 now. Any, any suggestions? Rin Who said Rinderpest? Was it you? A special treat for people that know about Rinderpest. <laughs> <laughs> well done. So it was, it was Rinderpest, right? So Rinderpest has deeper ulcers than foot and mouth disease, and, and it kills them. 96% mortality, if, if not more, right? So that's why there were 28 out of 32 dying. The others were on the point of dying. They had a camel there in the village. And do you know what they were doing to that? I mean, I had a big gingery beard, which was natural in those days. And, and that, they loved me because I was naturally ginger. And all the old men put henna on their beards to make them ginger. And they were putting henna on this, this uh, camel, one humped camel thing, to stop it dying from rinderpest. It worked because it didn't die. But I got samples from it. And I've took the pictures and sent them off to Per Brighton, my mate there. He was, said, oh, so we've never seen a picture of this in camels before. Anyway, he got it. But it was fascinating because the vultures were coming round. There were vultures everywhere, you see. And as I went round the village of Mugluff, round the thorn bush and the straw huts, there were a funeral coming towards me. A man was being carried on, the, wrapped in a shroud on the shoulders of all the, 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 Mus the Yemeni villagers, the Kabilis. But the stench was horrendous. So anyway, I did lots of post-mortems on, on these uh, rinderpests. But this is something for you to take notice, please. Pass it on. I get onto the radio the next day, because I'm the only white chappy in, in veterinary in this whole Tehran, about 250 miles long. And I ran on the radio the next morning at 6 o'clock, uh, because we had to sort of tell them where we were still alive. And I said, I need all the vaccine. My vaccinators are already out. We got Rinderpest. And I said, this is the guys, two men brought these cattle down from Saudi over the border. They were in that market yet, uh, two days ago. They're with us yesterday. Um, and it's causing problems. And uh, so what happened was nothing. <laughs> That's why you need to take notice, eh? <laughs> nothing happened. Right, I, I needed vaccine. We could have ring vaccinated it. But we knew the movement pathways. Well, I did. And, and, and I said, you've got to watch there because they'll be going up there, that valley and up this valley. Nothing happened. Not a single thing happened. And I found out afterwards, they thought the sun had got to me. <laughs> right? And I was misdiagnosing foot and mouth as rinderpest. But did the buggers come and get me out? No, did they help? Right, they left me there. And then finally they believed me, because one of the lads who was up in the mountains where it was much colder, he, he went to the marketplace where I said they would appear, and they appeared not two days' time, but the next week. 
and I went back to the country 10 years after that, it was still there. Right? So Rinderpest, who knows about, you know about Rinderpest, don't you, Anna? I'm Googling. You're Googling. <laughs> I'll waffle for a bit longer while you, right? It's been eradicated, that's how I know. Well, has it? <laughs> so they say. So they say. You see, the UK claims, it's like smallpox. They, they said it's, it's, it's like, like smallpox in as much that we've eradicated it. But here's the thing. The UK said that they've got rid of all their supplies because they've done all their genetic typing and et cetera, so they won't need it. But one of my friends who's sadly died now, but not of Rinderpest, he, 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 he <laughs> maintained that when they went after the breakdown of the Soviet Union, they went to their laboratories to get hold of the samples that they were holding in stock. They weren't there. So potentially, they're still around, eh? So you've got to wonder. That they, it, it, it survived for a long while in Sudan, and that's where it came out. Else Sorry? <laughs> Nothing else has survived. No? Well, years before, uh, it must have been about 60 years ago, they had an outbreak of Rinderpest crossing West Africa. And, and the, the authorities over there decided that they'd put these animals down, the ones that, that, that survived, and they buried them. And they buried them, but the locals were so hungry, they went and dug them up. Right? So then they put on the equivalent of Jay's fluid or one of those nasty disinfectants to make it going. And the soldiers joined the villagers in digging it up. So not only were they exhuming it, but they were dying of internal poisoning because they were, oh, if I put you off. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> And, and, and so they were dying of that sort of poisoning. So you've got to be so careful with, with what goes on. So um, that was sort of a, a, a scenario that I had with, 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 uh, with that. And you think the story is over, but it's not. Because when I was in Bombala, one of the vets from Biga rang me one day, and we used to go to races together and drink and so forth. And he said, I've got a camel that's sick. You know about camels. He said, I know nothing. I said, well, I don't know very much. But he said, would you come and have a look at it? So I said, yeah, all right, I'll come down in the morning. And I knew the guy who owned it because he had some land up with us. So I said, yeah, I'll, I, he said, I can't meet you, can't meet you. So anyway, I went down and mercifully it had died overnight. <laughs> See, so I didn't have to save it or anything <laughs> like that. And the background to the story was he'd, he'd taken three racing camels up to Queensland for a race. And they'd gone into this old sail yard, I forget where it was, and there was a nice green succulent plant growing there. And all the local camels from down south thought, oh, this is good. They hoed into it and they died because it was mother of millions, right? And I gather that's not very good, <laughs> right? So these things died, but this one didn't, and he brought it back. So anyway, I said to him, I said, well, I said let's, let's have a look and see what's inside this beast. And when I opened it up, it looked just like those rinderpest lesions, zebra stripings up and down the guts and all sorts of that. So, oh, that's great. So in those days, we had a system whereby the local DPI vet would come round and stay with us. You know, she'd come and drink wine with me, or Peter Windsor was that role for a while, and he'd come and stay and drink wine, and we had good veterinary chats. But anyway, I rang Ruby up, and she was in Goulburn, and I said, look, I've got this thing. I said, it's not Rinderpest, I said, because it doesn't exist here, but it looks just like it. Do you want me to put it down as an option? She said, yes, please. Let's get those people at EMAI doing some real work, you see. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so I, I did that, and they must have done a lot of real work, because they're still here, and they'd have closed them down if they weren't any good, you know. So, so that was really interesting. It turned out to be a salmonella. I can't remember which one. But it was really interesting because I wasn't expecting it. I had seen it, but I put it in. And it was just a phone call to Ruby. And she said, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Right? So I'm going to just move on from, from that one. Unless anybody got any questions about it? Because we've got a specialist here. <laughs> What's a camel? Well, a camel or rinderpest or whatever. Measles, close relation, a morbili virus, you're spot on. PPR. What does that mean? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> All these acronyms. It's French, just like OIE, right? Peste petit ruminant. No, they've changed it to something else, haven't they? It's like the bacteria we were talking about in the pigs. 
Yeah, they keep changing their blooming names, absolutely. So talking of bacteria, let me talk about this bacteria here. Where is it? Where, oh, yes. This is my anthrax one. <laughs> right, because we all know they have lots of these things on the top. So it was one of those early ones that I, I saw. We used to turn it up from time to time in various countries, but not so much in the Middle East. The biggest and the worst case I ever had with that one was actually in Mongolia. But I'll leave this hat on because you've seen that one. Um, and, and that was really interesting. And what happened was I was working in lots of towns and this particular place was up near the Russian border and it was called Selengi. And, and I'd go and stay there for a couple of weeks at a time all year round and, um, and I'd eat in the local restaurants and the local restaurants would buy their food from the market. Now, you could put your meat, if you're a, a sheep owner or a cow owner or a well, camel owner or a horse owner, you could put your meat in the market. You butcher it yourself wherever you want. You take it off to the market in the back of the car, slap it on the slab, no meat inspection, nothing like that. Right? I arrived there and after a couple of days I went to the lab and they said, we've got a problem. They've just found some people in the hospital with abdominal anthrax. Right? And they've died. Nasty. Oh, shit, nasty, nasty. And they didn't know where it had come from. They surmised that it had come from the, the market, because everybody went to the market. And I'm thinking, shit, I bet that's where they got my meat from, <laughs> you know, that I've been eating for supper. See? So anyway, I survived without any injections. And, uh, and then they, we wouldn't have got anywhere, except a few days later, two men went into the hospital with black lesions on their forearm, eh? anthrax lesions. And what happened, and, and I think that they got two dead animals, which they found, because it so, kills them so quickly. They cut them up, took them off to the market, sold them so they could get the money, and that's why they had those ones. And then it was about a year after that, there was a really interesting outbreak in Scotland, of all places. Anybody know this one? A whole group of people went down with chest versions of anthrax. And do you know what they'd been doing? They'd been drumming. You know the story. See, I'm not lying to you. <laughs> Would I lie to you, right? They were drumming and they'd got these tom-tom drums from Africa and the hides were impregnated with anthrax. So the boom, 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 boom. Better than white powder in an envelope because it spreads it around yourself, <laughs> right? So if anybody you don't like gives you a tom-tom drum from Africa, just be a bit careful. But they inhaled this, but they picked it up quite quickly. And I don't, they may have lost one person. And you don't dare say it was only a Scotsman or I'll have your guts for garters, <laughs> right? Uh, but that was a really, a really fascinating one. So... Um, I suppose it's fair enough to say that tuberculosis was a bigger part of my life because uh, we still had it in the UK when I was little and I worked on it. My grandfather, great-grandfather worked on tuberculosis. What spreads it in the UK? Badgers. They're the bastards. Cats, yes. They found it in, they found it in other things, but the badger is the number one. Now... You think, oh, that's all right, we just catch the badgers or vaccinate the badgers or do whatever you have to do, right? But what happens? The badger is a well-loved animal, apart from Scotsmen that turn it into the sporran and stuff like That's not a badger. <laughs> I could see you eyeing my sporran. And, 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 and so that was good until a certain sort of group of person decided that that was bad news to go killing badgers and <laughs> testing badgers, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? You've got ten minutes. <laughs> Tell, is that what you meant? Ten. Oh, I thought you said frighten everybody. <laughs> Great language, isn't it? <laughs> right? So what did they do? 
So my pal was great. He was loved his wildlife, got all sorts of awards. He picked up rabies in a Dorbenton's bat that was blown over from France, did the post-mortem. He found a, 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 a new worm that had never existed in birds in southeast uh, England. Uh, fabulous, behind the eyeball they were. And uh, so it's named after him. But he got these badges and he was doing testing on these badges. But the people that wear those hats decided no. So they would follow people when they went to put out the traps. And they would dam it started off by damaging and breaking the traps. Then they started following the people that put the traps to their home and beating their homes up and threatening their families, right? And then what did the clever little people do? Ah, oh, it's such a shame for these poor badgers to go. Let's move them from where those nasty vets are and move them to a part of the country where it's nice and safe and nobody's looking for them, right? So if you look at a map from mid-late 80s, you will suddenly see that instead of having them on Birdlip Hill in Gloucestershire and down in the West Country in Cornwall, they start appearing in Sussex, right, which is the other side of the country. And if you start looking at those early, f those early locations, you'd be surprised which famous people live right where those spots are on the map. I'm not going to say any more because I'm being filmed, but, <laughs> right, you look it up if you're that interested. Right, so tuberculosis was very interesting because a few years later I went to Saudi and I was in charge of 2,000 gazelles uh, that had tuberculosis and we were trying to release them back into the wild. And, and so we had to test and retest and we did PCRs and, 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 and goodness knows what else to try. And that was a fascinating, fascinating sort of thing. But one of the dangers that you might face in, in, in practice I'm sure it'll be trying. You'll get locked up, right, for trying to do your job. I got locked up in Yemen three times <laughs> for trying to do my job, right? So I, there was I. I was going to the souk to vaccinate all these cattle against rinderpest with my men. And I was there day one. I'd have been there lots of times before. And along comes this mullah. You know the mullahs, the religious people. And he starts arguing that we shouldn't be there. It's against the will of Allah, right? So... I, I, I wasn't going to take this because it was the end of our thing. So I started in my best Arabic and said, it is the will of Allah that I am here. He's given me the knowledge, right, to come here from my country to your country to help you. So anyway, you can imagine what's happening. This ginger bearded little white boy is talking to their mullah, right? And they all come round. It's like something out of the four feathers, you know, and there's all the chanting mobs in there. Anyway, they arrested me. Well, they arrested both of us and put us in jail. Well, jail was a lot of trees vertically and a few bits of shade over the top. So after about half an hour, 45 minutes, I mean, time slips by when you're having fun. And, 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 and I, they took us in front of the majlis, which is all the sheikh and his men. And we had to tell our story. So I gave my story, he gave his story, and we argued again. And, and, and they sent us back to jail. And about, not quite so long, about 20 minutes, they called us back again, and I'd won. See, I, my argument. I mean, good Arabic I must have. And, 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 and it, so they then sent the mullah off to jail. <laughs> so at which point I started going in to defend the mullah, saying he would understand it was the will of Allah and, and all this sort of stuff. And then I saw the shape winking at me. So I shut up, right? Because I'm, I'm quick on the uptake. And so I shut up. And then we sat down and we chewed gat and drank coffee and bun and all this sort of thing. And, and the next week, I turned up at this same village in Maglav to, to vaccinate again with all my men. Who should arrive? Same mullah friend, right? He came up, greeted, rubbed noses, cheeks, hugs, grabbed my hand took me around the market and any time any local cattle owner, Kabili, wouldn't have his animal vaccinated, he would say, it is the will of Allah! <laughs> anyway, got the whole soup vaccinated and everybody wanted to talk. But it was interesting. This is for Mark because the other day I said to Mark, I was like, and I knew that shape because he was, and I knew his son well, and he, he gave me a present a few months later. It was a horse, a stallion, an Arab stallion. I called it Thalu as you will, because that's the Arabic for stallion. And, and it was a lovely animal, but he said, and here was the kick in the ghoulies, if you like, he said, 
you make it better and it's yours. Right? Anyway, I looked at this animal. We didn't have lab samples where I was or lab tests. So anyway, I diagnosed African horse sickness. Right? It was a bit jaundiced and it was a mixture. It's long sanded, horrible. It was ugh, not, not good. Anyway, I kept the treatments that I could give it up until I went down with this nasty disease and was laid low. And this is where your, your teachers come in and your, your team leaders come in. Any other team leaders here? Right? I went down crook and I didn't go on the six or the seven o'clock radio program uh, call uh, for days because I was lying flat on the floor of my little shack. And did they come and get me? <laughs> no. No, they left me there. They thought because it was near Christmas, I decided to have a few days off. <laughs> right, so they didn't come and get me. And it turned out, I never knew what it was. Some American doctor came up, took a look at me 10 days later when I got up to the capital, and he said, uh, oh, hepatitis, boy, you got hepatitis. And he, he, and he asked me to do some press-ups. He said, oh, I could do 10. I was knackered. He said, no, you could do 10. I said, Stasha, my party piece is doing 100, and I get a drink for every one after I do that, you see? And, and you learn to do a lot. And, but when I went, joined MLA, they took some tests before they give you your Q fever, and they said I was positive. And I had it year, and that's what it was. They didn't tell me I'd got Brucella melitensis or Brucella suis. No, not suis, the abortus one in there. But that was a different test, I suppose. So, but I wanted to tell you about this African horse sickness because what was interesting is that the Arabs knew to take their horses up the mountains, and they did that in Africa. Take them up the mountains because the midges didn't love, live above a certain height up the mountain. Well, we were Tahama Desert, so we were right, low, low, low in the Rift Valley. So I think that's why it got it. But the Crusaders, when they arrived, if they were up in Jordan and up in the mountains, they were fine. But if they came down, that's when they got their, their sort of African horse sickness, as, they, as the thing shows you. So I thought I'd mention that one because insect born. Uh, and I suppose, this, uh, I've been given the 10 minute warning, so I'd better stop now. Um, but I've seen a lot of these other things up there. The Mongols think nothing of equine influenza. They think nothing of it. But I have to share you the one about trichinella in uh, Egypt. I used to do work in the, in the um, slaughterhouses. And uh, where's my slaughterhouse hat? Uh, be clinical at the end. And, and, and they would test for trichinella in the diaphragm. They never did anything about it because it was Christians that ate the pork, not the Muslims and all the people that did. I mean, that's cynical of me, I know. I mean, they probably would have done anything if it had been affecting them. But they, we used to get a lot of that in the Middle East, in uh, Mongolia, where they'd get the trichinella in things like badgers and, and bears, right? And that was a big problem because they'd eat whatever they could get up there as well. And, and, and I suppose the got to show that nearer to home, you've got to be think f that not all veterinary services are the same standard. I used to do meat inspection along with BSE checks in England and I, we take in carcasses from Italy and Spain and they came and they arrived and I never forget the first, I opened the back door and I had to break the seals and there were these carcasses and do you know what they had on them? We've, you haven't had steak today, have you? Uh, and it's, it's only cakes tonight. There were cigarette butts still sticking on the carcasses. And there were warbles. Anybody remember warbles? Like a bot thing, and it gets in, it comes out of the spine and comes under. When we were little boys, we'd and squirt them out like whiteheads, and they came out about the size of your thumb. Well, we eradicated it. So for several weeks, I was the only vet in the country diagnosing warble fly, because it was notifiable. And they said, I said, they're all dead. He said, well, how do you know? I said, well, I stamp on them as soon as they hit the ground. I said, that, I don't want any drug, drug resistance, <laughs> right? So they said, oh, are you sure? I said, yes, because if these men sweep it up, They'll drop them and they'll feed them and they'll just hatch and fly around Cornwall. So they did that. And then they gave notice to Spain and Italy that we didn't want this SH1T coming in. And it still came. 
So we got a consignment and I turned around and I said, no, we're not having it. It had come all the way, I forget which one it was. I said, no, we're not having this. Rejected, rejected. And they said, well, can you give us a health certificate so we can take it back home? And I said, no. Why would I give you a health certificate for something I've refused because it's unhealthy? God, you should have seen. It was your equivalent that was not happy with me, but I'm bugging if I was going to let them get away with it. We never had any more problems after that. But anyway, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. That's some stuff from the front line. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you.